horror fans, welcome back to 237, back with another review. And as we get to the end of September, I'm kind of in review limbo because uh, I often have something planned for the month of October. This year I do as well. Last year was kind of weird because I was still doing Italian horror and Giallo reviews, carried over in, into October. But uh, I do have something planned for this October. I'm still waiting for the last of my A24 films to come in. I'll just do those when they come in. And so I'm kind of just doing random stuff here, but uh, I guess this will be the start of what I have planned for the month of October, which is I do want to finish the anthology collection that I started like two years ago. And since I haven't done too many, I figured why not make October Stephen King month as well and just go through whatever adaptations I have or can get in that time. Also, a couple of my recent reviews have just been the result of me flipping through Netflix. This is a Netflix original. It's a movie I have seen. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing Stephen King films, I'm on Netflix. Why not just do this one now? And I have to say, I, I saw this when it first came out in 2017. Really liked it. Even at that point, I thought, this is one of the best made Ad Stephen King adaptations that I've seen. Uh, so going into it for a second viewing here, I was wondering if that would still hold up. It still does. I still think this is one of the best adaptations. Not Now, when I say best a adaptations, I mean just as a movie that happens to be based on one of his books, but also just with how close and faithful it is to the source material. I know a lot of people will do like top 10 best adaptations and The Shining will be number one, which is notorious for being completely different from the book. So best adaptation means how close and faithful it is to the source material. And this is one of the best ones. And again, it's a Mike Flanagan film, which recently I reviewed uh, Ouija Origin of Evil. Mike Flanagan is one of the best horror directors to come out of the last decade. And he's actually done two Stephen King adaptations. And this was his first one, Gerald's Game. Now, his other one was Dr. Sleep, which I have seen. I also really like. That's also pretty different from the book, from what I gather. But this is based on the 1992 book, Gerald's Game, which for years has kind of been considered unfilmable just because of just the nature of the book both in the present tense and in the flashbacks or the ex exposition we get of character Jesse's past. And one thing I like is how it's been considered a sister or companion book to Dolores Claiborne, which is not a horror book or movie, but this is another one that's one of my favorite Stephen King films and one of the best Stephen King films. Uh, linked together by an eclipse and a girl dealing with you know, woman dealing with trauma but also a sexually abusive father uh, both of these are first editions I do have a video of my Stephen King book collection if you want to go check that out but um so I am gonna put kind of a true I don't know why I'm holding this up so it, it is based on the book and it is very faithful um, I'm going to do a trigger warning ahead of time. This does deal with some heavy material dealing with uh, sexual abuse of a child, a young girl. And although it's done in probably the as tastefully as something like that can be, that also makes it more effective. I mean, if you're going for shock value, like a Serbian film... It, that's all it is, is shock value. This is one of the most effective, tense, just unnerving and unsettling scenes of like child molestation that I've ever seen. One of the most effective. I mean, it is, again, uh, tasteful in the sense you don't see anything, but, you know, it it's done in such a way that's so realistic and yeah, so atmospheric and tense and just 
unnerving. So if something like that bothers you, maybe stay away from this review and film. It's not the central point of the film, but it is a, as the scene, at least. But the theme of it is a major part of the film. Now, of course, as you can tell by the cover and the cover of the book, this is also a movie you should go into as blind as possible. So I'm just going to give the bare synopsis, and then I'll get into spoilers. Yes, there is a couple who, where the wife is left handcuffed to a bed when her husband suffers a heart attack. They're out at their summer home, way out in the middle of nowhere. And it's her trying to survive. He's dead. She's handcuffed to a bed. And days are passing. It, how is she going to get out of it? But also her, her inner demons and thoughts are starting to come out and show. That's all I'm going to get into plot-wise. Because I, I do think this is one of those movies to go into blind. Also, another thing that really works for me... At, personally is this is one of those movies where one I do like the kind of survival horror you know like open water if people go in the water boat leaves they're stranded Adam Green's frozen they're up on a ski lift they shut down they're stuck up there movies like that where it's just one location very limited in this case one character they're they're in a situation how do they get out of it? And with this, we have one character in one location, one room, and it's completely carried by the phenomenal performance of Carla Cugino, which I believe is how you pronounce her name, Spy Kids Mom, Silk Spectre in Watchmen, uh, Marv's probation officer in Sin City. This is a career-defining role. She, she did a phenomenal job both as Jesse and sort of her uh, projected conscience, I guess. Excuse me. So if, if movies like that you find boring, I guess you won't like this, which I don't know how people can. But, you know, I love limited setting, limited cast, and just more of the situation unfolds. I wouldn't say it's as intimate as say Locke with Tom Hardy but it's kind of along the same lines we rarely leave this room except for the flashbacks when she was 12 and I mean this movie has atmosphere there are scenes that are genuinely fucking creepy and scary like m mostly the scenes to do with uh, the Midnight Man or the Moonlight Man uh, the scenes with Henry Thomas as her father are also unsettling. Again, some of the most realistic and effective child sexual abuse scenes that I've ever seen. So, very good, very tense, atmospheric film. You really get the sense of isolation, dread, uh, lots of suspense because there's also this dog that can just come in and out of the house to feed on Gerald. But yeah, it, written and directed by Mike Flanagan, co-written by Jeff Howard, based on the book by Stephen King. Stars Carla Gugino and Bruce Greenwood as Gerald, who voiced Batman in uh, uh, Under the Red Hood, Death of the Family, Gotham by Gaslight, and Young uh, Justice. Also, Henry Thomas as her father. Uh, Michael... Uh, Fimignari, if I pronounce that correctly, did the cinematography. He's done that for a few of Flanagan's films. And the Newton brothers did the score. They also sco scored a few of uh, Flanagan's films. And it got great reviews. I mean, it has a 90-something of Rotten Tomatoes, and I would agree with that. I would say this is that good. Now... Oh, also, the, the Midnight Man or Moonlight Man is played by Carol... I've never been able to pronounce his last name. Carol Strucken, uh, Strucken Lurch from the 90s Adams Family is a series of movies. Great to see him again. And he is legitimately frightening looking. But also the lighting and the atmosphere helps everything as well. 
So that's all I'm going to give as far as the film goes. Uh, highly recommend it. I mean, this is one of those movies where if the main performance does not work, then the whole movie falls apart. And Carla Gugino nails it. Because she's handcuffed to a bed, so I mean, she's constantly tearing up. Hair's messed up, makeup running, getting more pale, dry lips, tired and weathered. But also playing, you know, herself, sort of her conscience, where, you know, she looks like she did in the very beginning of the film. So it's very, not jarring, but to go back and forth and just see just how tormented she is. Or how, you know, traumatic this is for her. But, I mean, for a movie that's 103 minutes, it is very fast-paced. I mean, within the first 10 minutes, she's already handcuffed to the bed. And things are uh, already going. Now, I will say, it felt like she was there for less than 48 hours, maybe. But you do get this, a big theme in the film is time and how time is of the essence, time is a factor. Uh, but it goes at a very fast pace. And one thing I'm kind of mixed on, and granted it doesn't hurt the film at all, but I wonder what it would be like without this. And that's the sort of mental projections of Bruce Greenwood as Gerald and Carla Gugino herself as the mental projection of her. Sort of talking to her, kind of giving her guidance on what to do and sort of the secrets or sort of working out her inner demons. I wonder what it would have been like if it was played more straight, like just her. I know it would have been a quieter film, a slower film, but I wonder if that would... Me, personally, I probably would have found it just as engaging, but I do wonder what it would have been like if it, it if that hadn't have happened. Now, granted, I know that needs to be there because that's what she needs to work out her past and how to survive, how to get out of this situation, but I wondered. Also, I got to give credit to the lighting, because as I've said with the books, the this eclipse is kind of the backdrop of the past stories in both books. The way the eclipse is lit in this film is fantastic. The just that crazy red that lights everything up, and when the sexual abuse is happening, that's when the eclipse is full and it's just red. Very well done. The The lighting was superb in this. So, yeah, if, the only reason I could say don't check this out is it, if you are triggered by that kind of abuse and if you just don't like movies that follow very... Um, um, a minimal characters in, in a minimal settings. Other than that, this movie's great. It's got a suspense, scenes that are genuinely terrifying and creepy looking. Uh, just a great story of survival. It does have some grisly, visceral, brutal moments too. That I remember when I first saw it, I was like, geez, I, I wasn't expecting it to be that bloody. Which the effects are well done as well. And the performances are wildly good. So, I'm definitely a big fan of them. This is in my top 10 best adaptations as far as just well-made movies that are also very faithful to the source material. But also top 10 Stephen King movies. Like just good movies regardless of how faithful they are just based on being good movies. Like... My favorite movie is The Shining, so that would not be in my top 10 best adaptations, but it's number one, you know, everywhere else. So, that's Gerald's Game. Go check it out. Spoilers. Now, I if I remember correctly, in the book, the heart attack is induced when 
she's pleading to get out of the handcuffs and she kicks him in the groin I think when he has an erection really hard and that causes I could be wrong but I want to say that's what caused a heart attack that doesn't happen here he does take Viagra and he just has it but and also throughout the film the whole idea of her kind of not being able to tell what's real and what's not starting with the projections of Gerald and herself also comes with uh, uh, the Moonlight Man and she doesn't know if he's real or not which by the end of the film we find out he is real but he also represents the trauma the memories the baggage of everything about her father and everything about Gerald because we find out Gerald wasn't the best husband it was kind of one of those situations where someone who's been abused grows up to marry that kind of person. Um, it does go in depth with their sex life and their, you know, the history of their marriage, but, it, you know, kind of, it draws parallels between how her father molested her and his handcuffs was pro pro making her promise silence, whereas Gerald's was kind of a comfortable life, I guess. And the Moonlight Man, her, I kind of took it as her not knowing if he's real or not, kind of represented her a, a denial of everything. Because even when she's talking to the projections, she's kind of defending her father, even saying it's her own fault, even though she was 12. And so like by the end of the film, which also you know, when she gets out of the predicament, she still sees the vision of him in her apartment. And, you know, when he finally gets arrested in, in court, she shows up, looks at him, and she sees the image of Henry Thomas, Bruce Greenwood, in him. It kind of closes the door on them, you know, because uh, uh, Carol striking is a large human being and she says like you're a lot smaller than I remember kind of taking their power away then leaves so I think he kind of represents the trauma abuse just, uh, everything negative uh, about them and yeah while the scenes with young Jesse were still very effective very well made the most interesting parts are how does she get out of all this? I mean, there's there's a scene where, or scenes obviously involving the dog. She tries to kick to keep the dog away from Gerald that is feasting on. Wakes up at one point with a dog biting her leg. And I would say it, it deals with a lot of real stuff. I mean, she falls asleep like this. So she has no circulation. So she has to kind of kick her legs to get all the circulation back. There are some like, oh, damn moments. Like uh, the shelf above, there's a glass of water, which she's able to tilt to slide it down and catch it because she's starting to dehydrate. But then when she goes to drink it, the cuffs only allow like that far. So it has a lot of moments like that where it's like it builds, it builds, and then just when something good's gonna happen, it goes away. But you know, she's able to take the price tag from her the nightgown, roll it up into a straw, and finally, she gets the idea to smash. And this is a pretty grisly, realistic, bloody scene break the glass, wedge it into the shelf, and then cut her wrist to lubricate to lubricate it, wow, and then slip it out. But it catches on the cut and pretty much degloves half of her hand. And the way the tendons and the meat looks, it looks painful. And of course her performance backs all that up. 
And yeah, I mean, that's basically the movie. Uh, very well made. It's Mike Flanagan, so it's very well shot. It looks great. Uh, it does do a great job with time. Even though it feels like she's not in there for a very long time, you know, it's not 127 hours where you really feel the length of time. But here, you know, we'll kind of... It, it'll focus on something like the door leading into the hallway and we'll just see the daylight fade into darkness and then we'll see her again kind of trying to stay awake so very well shot beautifully uh, astonishingly acted and also since it's Mike Flanagan very little to no jump scares I mean I don't think there's if if I had to give any kind of jump scare it would be when she's having the dream of her past and it shows her as a young girl and then she looks down, gets scared and when it shows her feet we see the uh, a moonlight man licking her feet for like a quick second with the, a music sting. That's like the only jump scare. It's really built on atmosphere, tension, dread, all the things that makes a horror movie effective and not cheap. Which is one of the main reasons why I love and respect Flanagan so much. Is because he's so reluctant toward jump scares. And I appreciate that so much. So yeah. And as far as the 2010s go and recent Stephen King adaptations. I'm probably in the minority. Excuse me. I always thought it was overrated. Whether it's Tim Curry or it's the newer one the original or the new one I like this movie more than both it films and I will review maybe all three it's uh during October but yeah I this is more my Stephen King story I mean my favorite Stephen King book is a, a misery my favorite adaptation is misery <laughs> You know, I really like his less supernatural films more. Which is why I'm glad the Moonlight Man was shown to be real. I mean, there are scenes where he's a hallucination, but ultimately he is real. And those are those are the scariest scenes. I mean, those are genuinely creepy. When she's laying in bed, the corner of the room is complete darkness. And you can just barely make out the shape of him standing there. And he just kind of steps out slowly. It's very well done. This whole movie's well done. Definitely one of the best adaptations as far as just tone and loyalty to the source material. And just how good of a movie it is. I really like Gerald's Game. So yeah, I may not start the Stephen King and Anthology Marathon right off. But it's definitely something I'm going to be doing throughout October. It's probably going to be random films. Maybe I'll start early on these. But uh, that's what what's coming soon. And I do have a couple more A24 films to get to as well. Along with those countdowns, collection videos, whatnot. So stay tuned for all that. And uh, thank you for watching. Oh!